Historically, his country has shared a lot with its northern neighbor, a multi-billion dollar trade agreement and thousands of miles of border. But could this common ground in fact be the undoing of their long-standing relationship? I'm Rita Fakhri, and I'm speaking to former Mexican President Felipe Calderón one-on-one. -on -one. I will build a great, great wall. It's going to be in a stupid and useless wall. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. We are a country that deserves respect. The United States and Mexico are not simply neighbors. We are, by choice, friends and partners. My strategy was to protect Mexican families from the criminals and to establish the rule of law in Mexico. My government fight those criminals. I believe that the problem of Mexico is the corruption. Tremendous drugs are pouring into the United States. The American consumption is the real origin of our problem. We've had a very bad deal with Mexico. No one can afford a trade war. Our factories have left our country. He doesn't understand trade. Our jobs have left our country. He doesn't understand the economy. First loser of such kind of a stupid decision would be the American people. President Calderon, thank you very much indeed for speaking to us uh, on TRT World and for having us in your office here in Mexico City. No, thank you, and welcome to Mexico. Thanks very much. Let me ask you, when you look back at your time in office, your U.S. counterparts were President Bush, President Obama. In hindsight, somehow, do you wish you were president of Mexico now to deal with this new phenomenon uh, known as uh, President Trump, the Trump administration, and all the challenges they represent. Always is an honor to be president of a big country, great country like Mexico. And of course, every, every circumstance is different from any president. So I'm very proud to be president of Mexico in such difficult times. I lead the country. Um, honestly, I had a very good relationship with both presidents of the United States. Do you feel you were somehow lucky to have been president back then? I don't believe in such kind of things like to be lucky or not, or unlucky or not. I believe that you need to face your own circumstances, and I did it. Some of them were horrible, other were only marvelous. But in this particular case, I had a very good relationship with the President of the United States, either Republican President Bush or Democrat President Obama. It was a great relation. Your predecessor, Vincente Fox, did not mince his words when he spoke about Trump likening him to Hitler. Your successor, Peña Nieto, is perhaps more guarded. He has recently decided not to visit Washington, D.C. After all, this will be the second time that he shelves a planned visit to the United States for fear of appearing weak, I suppose, in public over the border issue. Would you have done things differently if you were him, or do you think he is being wise in an election year, strategically and politically, by staying away from Washington? Well, uh, I don't like to talk about my successor. I respect President Peña, and I will do that. Everyone has a different style to be president. Everyone has a right and the duty to manage the things according with uh, his or her advisors or according with the circumstances, I repeat. Uh, in my own case, I believe that regarding any president, it is quite important to lead the nation with dignity. But if you are president and a and candidate, and a candidate Trump, the, you know, who then wins the election uh, and, of course, uh, is governing over your very powerful northern neighbor. When he makes sweeping statements during the campaign about Mexicans, calling them all rapists, when he threatens constantly about building a wall and making Mexico pay for it, how do you view these types of statements? Simple, empty bluster, bombastic, empty words? Or do you take him at, at face value? It's evident that President Trump has been so insulting towards Mexico. Um, I believe that he has had and he will have an adequate response for coming from any Mexican, including myself. What is the adequate response? Which we don't accept such kind of insults and we reject such kind of uh, offensive treatment. Um, of course, we are a country that deserves respect. But, but indeed, how do you get the respect? I mean, to what extent can Mexico flex its muscle? 
never get in your neighbor. knees, even in front of the United States. You know, Mexico has a, a history of dignity in front of the United States. Mexico has been the border of the world against the United States. And we know how to deal with that. After Trump's leave office, we will stay there with the Mexican, and he will leave. I don't know where, and with respect of who. Uh, but the point is, uh, we don't accept such kind of offense, and we will continue our own path, I hope with dignity from the top, to the president, to the last of the Mexican people. But in the case of Trump, is it just an issue of style? Because let's face it, other presidents, US presidents, have not just spoken about walls, they've actually built walls along the border and fences for the past 30 years, including Clinton and Obama and others. And very little is, is said about that. Is that unfair in a way? No. Uh, honestly, we know such kind of behavior of the American presidents. Actually, the, the part of the wall that President Trump is going to build is going to be exactly in the very same part that the wall that it was already built, I don't know, two or three decades ago. So we know that story. They are acting for the people, and it's going to be in a stupid and use, useless uh, wall. Why? Because we, the Mexicans, for instance, we have a, an, a negative ratio of immigration to the United States. Or in other words, there are more Mexican workers coming back to Mexico than the number of Mexican workers going to the United States. But still, still there is a problem that has to be addressed to do with illegal immigration. There is a problem, and yes, but it's not a problem related with border. Mexican workers. Yeah, but so Trump? Either he ignores the fact that Mexico has a negative migration towards the United States, or he just uh, simply un he doesn't understand that uh, Mexico is not exactly well, the problem. Well, I, well, as the, you say, I mean, Mexicans are crossing back into Mexico, or at least immigrants who've been in the U.S., at a faster rate today than they had been previously. But still, there are a lot of undocumented, as you know, I, there are a lot of problems immigrants in the United with, States. There are a lot of problems hundreds, related with hundreds enforcing of thousands, the law everywhere, hundreds, in the United States or in Mexico. Mr. President, as you know, hundreds of thousands of undocumented workers live in the U.S., many of them Mexicans. We don't know the exact figures because they also come from other countries, but the estimates are about 80 percent of them were born in Mexico. What happens no, if Trump... No, that isn't true. If I, I, if I get your question correctly, that is not true. The net, the net ratio of immigration to the United States related to Mexican workers is negative. No, I'm, not talking, is I'm talking about the lower so than zero. the so-called dreamers. Yeah, but it was completely in the immigrants, past. Immigrants, Mr. President, from Mexico and other countries who were brought into the United States by their parents without documentation have been allowed, as you know, under President Obama's policy known as DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, have been allowed to stay in the United States, study, work, live, for renewable periods of two years if they you know, did not break any, any laws and met certain which is, educational criteria. Which is fine. But this is all set to change under Trump. If he follows up on his threat and deports all of these people, what should Mexico do? Well, first, let me tell you, we are talking in a very specific question about the dreamers. But and it could we be very are, real, a real we, prospect. Completely real, I agree with you. Uh, let me tell you the first loser of such kind of a stupid decision would be the American people. Because all those kids are the smarter, the, the bravest, um, the people very well trained, educated. Many people within American society feel that these immigrants are a threat to the authentic American national identity, which they feel, at least in their eyes, should be white and European. What do you say to those? It is a completely racist criteria. And uh, if Mr. Trump considers that the American identity is a white identity, it is important that he needs to say that. And I believe not only the Mexicans, we all, the entire world, and most of the American people will reject such kind of a, a racial issue coming from the most powerful president of the world. Of course, Trump's widely condemned, uh, many would say quite outrageous comments that the U.S. should be open to immigrants from, say, Norway, um, when he referred to countries from other regions in less than flattering terms. Many people pointed to the racism factor there. But you went a little further. You said he is exploiting feelings like Hitler did in his time. Do you yes. think it's an appropriate analogy? Do you still stand by it? Well, what is the profile of Hitler? 
What exactly such kind of people do? They blame like a foreign forces, either people or merchandises, about the problems of their own people, which is completely unfair and mistaken. But some will see you taking but this there to is, a different it's, level. But it is some manipulation. And what is worse in this case is because they are using race. They are using the color of the people, which is completely inhuman. And yes, in that sense, it's possible to compare any, not only Trump, but any kind of president using these arguments with the worst criminal in the world, which was the case of Hitler. Well, talking, ta talking about criminals, uh, the war on drugs, which is something that started under your watch. When you became president of Mexico in late 2006, soon thereafter, this war on the drug cartels began, and you adopted quite a militaristic approach, sending um, a large-scale deployment of federal troops into towns and cities against the drug cartels. Clearly, that approach doesn't seem to have worked, because if we look at 2017, it is the deadliest year on record, according to the estimates of the Interior Ministry of Mexico. 30,000 people killed in drug-related uh, crimes. Would you, would you admit that it has failed no, and things should be done perhaps you, differently? You, you made several statements in Go one ahead. single question that I need to clarify one by one. Sure. I did not declare war on drugs. If there is an expression like that, it was coined by President Nixon in the 70s is not the strategy that I follow with Mexico. But it's not about what the I, words. It's not about the, the names. Let me, let me go one by one it's about the arguments. That. Mm -hmm. My strategy was to protect Mexican families from the criminals and to establish the rule of law in Mexico. Why? Because I believe that Mexico never will be a developed country if we don't make Mexico a rule of law country. And that's the goal, protecting families and making rule of law. Third. What is happening in Mexico, and it was happening when I took office, there is a process of capturing, organized crime capturing the state, either through corruption at local, municipal, and state levels, in some cases at federal level, or threatening the criminals to the policemen or the attorney generals. And those guys were taking over the control of the cities and the states. And I just stopped that process. I just started to face those criminals. And all those things that you are talking about, that is a process in which the criminals are fighting each other for the control of the territories. In other words, the strategy of the government didn't provoke the beginning of those homicides. Well, many, what, would, well, many would argue, Mr. President, because with 50,000, with 50,000 federal, federal troops yes. and police thrown into the mix, it obviously leads to a lot of killings on either side. Well, Human rights groups have suggested that a lot of the killing, perhaps as many as 30,000, were done at the hands of police officers with complete impunity, without lack of accountability. And you've just said the establishment of the rule of law oh, well, is preeminent but, for you. Well, but why I insist on that? Do you think these charges there were are, legitimate? Lot, you say there are a lot of documents, and I would say there are a lot of myths about that. And a lot of people, and I want to be, I want to personalize that, but a lot of people, they take for granted a lot of those assertions, which are not exactly proven and not exactly true. Yes, there were a lot of abuses in Mexico before me, in my government, and after my government, but any time my government realized or knew any kind of those abuses, all those people were prosecuted in justice. But let me go back to my point. Most of those homicides are not provoked by the government. Those homicides are provoked by criminals without mercy. And my government fight, fight those criminals. That's the, that's the reality. Those criminals are killing people. I defend the people. And those criminals are really who provoke the homicides, not the government. And, and fast forwarding to today, uh, it's, it's, still, it's still a problem. Uh, no, Mr. I, President, I let, me, finish, let me just ask uh, you the no, question. Because it seems to the me government, that. I didn't finish yet. The government, yes, there were a lot of police corps and even attacking or abusing the people. That's exactly what I'm describing to you. When I took office, the organized crime was taking over the control of police corporations and attorney general offices in a lot of places in Mexico. Those policemen in the control of organized crime were, kidn were kidnapping and killing the people. And what is completely necessary was to recover those police corporations and attorney general offices and governments or mayors offices in order to protect the people again. 
So, just, those look, policemen were acting in the name of the criminals, not in the name of the government. Okay, but just looking at the issue very briefly before moving on. It's not, today, it's not easy to, to see that very briefly, come on. But huh? briefly, Mr. President. Quite complex problem. When, of course it is. And, and when Mexicans... One of the populist people do is try to explain in a very few words quite complex problem. Of course. Don't get on that. Sure. But when Mexicans blame the violence, not just on the drug cartels, but on failed government strategies and policies, on collusion between senior government officials and drug cartel leaders, on corruption, what do you say to them? Not I, in your time, Well, in today, that part, I today. agree with that. There are a lot of problems related with corruption. What I did is, instead of the traditional point of view of some of my adversaries or other governments saying, don't do anything on the criminals. Just try to get an arrangement with them. Don't fight them. Just look, at, look to the other side. I did the right thing. What is, I never get in any agreement with any criminal. I don't believe in corruption. I believe that the problem of Mexico is the corruption precisely with the police corporation. But of course, the whole... instead of Instead of reaching an agreement with the criminals, I fought the criminals. But of course, was my duty. Uh, this whole issue of the on ongoing drug trade and it's crossing over into the United States is being used today by the U.S. president precisely. And by to the journalists, by the way. No, and the journalists, the journalists are looking at the reality on that. the ground. It's good interviews about that. Not at all. But I mean, it's being used by the American president because the he wants to stop. He wants to stop the flow of drugs into the country. Right. MS-13, other gang members. Clearly, nothing has worked so far. What do you think needs to be done? What would be the strategy today in 2018 to deal with this? First, I don't care about how much drugs the American people want to consume. I don't care. It's not my problem. And the main source of the problem is the American consumption. If there is no demand, there won't be offer, there won't be supply. So the, the American consumption is the real origin of our problem. How do you stop it? The problem in Mexico is not only about drugs, or not mainly even. In some places, the problem we are facing is that organized crimes has the control of the city or the town or some states. Once you allow the criminals to have the control of the mayor office, of the governor office in one place, those criminals start to practice extortion on the people, kidnapping, extorting, establishing protection rackets, and destroying the environment in which you can prosecute the criminals. In the tradition I found when I took office, the tradition was let them to do whatever they want. And that was the big mistake. Well, that's it a is. lack of accountability again, the impunity I agree. that went on for I very long. I agree with that completely. Who would be best positioned among the candidates in the election of the 1st of July. Who would be best positioned to take on this strong leadership well, role? My mother's opinion, a beautiful, smart lady named Margarita Zavala. I was just about to mention her, and she's an independent candidate and happens to be your wife. Happens to be my wife, yes. But how do you Which I have a very biased opinion about well, her, I admit I, that. That doesn't surprise me, and that's good, because otherwise it might have been a case for divorce. But she's an independent candidate. She's not the candidate of your party, the Partido Acción Nacional. Could it be a case of divorce within your own party if you voted for her? Will you vote for her? Do you, do you have faith that, that she might her. actually completely. win? Completely. But I can't she actually her. win? Because most well, posters say she has no chance. No, come on. Don't say don't chance. As an independent. As a woman and as, as an independent in a society completely tired about political parties, of course she, she has a chance. And you cannot say she has no the, the campaign has not started yet. And you are saying he has another chance? Well, that's what the posters it's, it's are saying. The analysts. About cultural vision no, about the issue is about for the an independent that, woman? Oh, come on. No, not at all. But the issue is that there are three main uh, parties yeah. that traditionally have much yeah. more of a chance. Uh, Lopez Obrador, you say the campaign hasn't started, but he's been making very strong statements, again, likening Trump to Hitler, saying he will put him in his place. Would your wife, would a uh, Margarita Savala administration actually also be that tough leader who would put Trump in his place? Well, I know her, and she's tough. How tough would she be? Tougher, much tougher than him, than this guy you are mentioning. I'm very sure she will uh, fight very hard in order to, to make a, a fader agreement. For instance, thinking about trade. Exactly. Mexico have a lot of instruments to, to make a good negotiations with the Americans. But can it afford a trade war? Because as we speak, the seventh round of negotiations has begun here in Mexico City uh, in relation to NAFTA. No one can afford a trade war. But when I say no one, I refer as well to the American 
people. There are always alternatives, though. There's always China and other countries. Well, that want good, to good. Be my guest. Go with China all the way. Actually, Trump is blaming Mexico about trade deficit. Oh, come on. Look, the trade deficit with China is several times the trade deficit with Mexico. Maybe he ignores that. That's a problem that the American society has right now. But, but do you feel that NAFTA has been good for Mexico? Because many people say that it's actually also exploited. Mexico's small many scale people. farmers, the environment. Do, does many people say that? Do you agree with that? No. I've Some not. economists and politicians have said that. Uh, quote me one of them. Well, without naming any, because there's so many. No. But How anyway, do you view it? Uh, it's been uh, good for big business, there's, there's no that, doubt. No, it has been very good for Mexico, let me tell you. The income per capita in Mexico, uh, purchasing uh, power parity in the year 1992, was well, like a $2,000 a year. After NAFTA, uh, PPP is $14,000, yeah. the income per capita. It's completely good. There is no more evident uh, uh, economic evidence of that. But let me tell you, salaries. And you're right in that trade has quadrupled in the last 23 yeah. years we since were, NAFTA. Well, look, look Between at, at least point. Mexico, America. I believe that the, at this and Canada. Rate, Mexico is exporting to the United States roughly like a one and a half billion dollars a day. Is that good or not for Mexico? Come on, it's completely good. It's a no brain. Uh, but, but, but Trump, you know, has a lot of demands. He wants to end the value-added tax on U.S. companies. He says he would otherwise impose 35% tariffs on Mexican imports. What would you do? Should there be a realignment? Should you be looking perhaps south towards Brazil and other markets? We can do that. And let me tell you that even the government, uh, Mexican government, is, is doing so. For instance, there are lots of uh, Trump supporters in the Middle West of the United States, no? Kansas State, a lot of farmers produce of corn, wheat, a lot of stuff we buy. We are buying to the Americans roughly like a 15 million tons of wheat and corn from all those Trump supporters. Actually, if Trump tried to block trade, it's very easy to us to say, well, exactly what you are saying. We can buy exactly the same wheat on the same grains from Ar Argentina or Brazil. Who are going to be the losers of these stupid decisions? The American Trump supporters. So do you think he's bluffing? No. <laughs> Or do you think he will pull out of NAFTA? No, if you say it's in everyone's advantage. I believe he doesn't understand trade, with all respect. He doesn't understand the economy. But you know, those farmers understand perfectly. If the trade with Mexico is canceled, they will be the big losers of this deal. But, but just looking at Mexico, some two million estimated small-scale farmers are believed to have lost their livelihoods as a result of NAFTA. So we can't say Completely it's all been fantastic. No. Com with all respect, you are wrong on that. No. These, these are no, what the no, reports no. suggest. Mexico uh, has the third year in a row like, like a net exporters of agricultural products by first year in history. And most of the winners are not only uh, some of those farmers are winners in that. But its economy has not grown, I think you will accept, at the rate of the Brazilian or even Chilean economy. I agree with you completely, but NAFTA is not the reason why the economy is not growing at the, at the very good pace we deserve. NAFTA isn't the factor that demonstrates that trade is good for economic growth. And actually, if you are able to analyze the data, the economy link with NAFTA and the United States is growing almost three times than the rest of the Mexican economy. So NAFTA, it's, a, it's an engine to, for economic growth, the trade in general. Now, the big question is why the economy is not growing? In my opinion, is the lack of rule of law. That kind of lack of rule of law explains economic uncertainty, lack of investment, lack of trade relationship, lack of judge in terms of controversy, and that explains the lack of rule. Otherwise, if Mexico were a rule of law country, as I try to do it, and I put the country in the path of that, Mexico will grow at rates of 5 or 6 percent. And I couldn't explain the same for a lot of countries in the world. Mr. President, just ending where we began with the unexpected election of That's Donald quite passionate Trump. Interview, I and and now the, the election coming up on the 1st of July. If you were a betting man, who would you bet on? Margarita Zavala, definitely. That's a very safe bet. It is. But maybe I'm, not a politically like, astute bet, is I'm, it? No, 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 not at all. It's like, uh, I don't like to bet, honestly. I'm a, I, I am a man of principles and ideas. And honestly, I think it's the, the most convenient thing for Mexico.
Now, of course, I enjoy very much my tenure as president. I suffered it. There were some terrible days, but a lot of satisfactions that you can never forget. No? The people, the support of the people. When I ended my tenure, uh, according with the Reforma newspaper, I had 68% of approval among the people. And that kind of things, regardless the quite difficult times I needed to leave, was an incredible experience. And now with the tweets, your popularity might have increased as well. Well, I love Twitter, honestly. But uh, my wife, committee, they suggested me to reduce the intensity of my Twitters. All right. Well, on this note, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. President Calderon, thank you very much for thank speaking you. to us.